Hello again. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Mark chapter 10. I have it on the overhead if you'd like to watch, but you can also read your Bibles. We'll read this text and we'll let uh, blind Bartimaeus, who after meeting Jesus sees again or sees for the first time, teach us some lessons about how to get through the struggles of life. Now they came to Jericho as he, Jesus, went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then many warned him to be quiet. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And so Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he arose and came to Jesus. And so Jesus answered and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus is asking that same question for us today. What do you need? Are you struggling? You have pain? Are you lonely? Do you have more month than money? Is everything at home the way it should be? What do you need? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, teacher, that I may receive my sight. And then Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you whole or well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. You ever been in a model home? Everything is perfect. Until you move in. And you've been there one day. And you go to turn something on and it doesn't work. Or you turn the corner and you skin something. Either yourself or the wall. You're moving in and you're moving out. Something always happens. Life is full of struggles. You and I are trying to build a holy home inside ourselves, inside with our wife and our family, or with our parents. We're trying to build that in our neighborhoods. We're trying to build that in the congregation where we worship and work. We're trying to build that in our, our city, our county, our state, our nation, and indeed the world. We want everything to be godly, but we're going to struggle. I wish I could tell you that preachers, we don't have any struggles, but oh, we do. We are just like you. As a matter of fact, when you look in the scriptures, you'll find men and women, before we let uh, Bartimaeus teach us something, you'll find men and women down through the ages of time that have struggled just like you and just like me. They've had lives that became messy. Though they tried to serve God, though they tried to be faithful, things broke. Things broke down within themselves and their own walk with God, with their, with, within their families, within their uh, communities. Life often gets messy. When you, when you think about these people that I'm going to mention, what do you think of? And ask yourself a question. In the lives of these men and women, did they have struggles like I do? Did their lives get messy and dirty as they live from day to day? What about Abram and Sarai? We know them as Abraham and Sarah. Did they ever have any problems? 
Well, you should smile because if you're a Bible student and you know about Abraham and Sarah, you know that they struggled. Oh, how terribly they wanted a son. I mean, after all, God had promised Abraham and Sarah that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through them. The, the, the big problem was is they didn't have any children. I mean, God, how can you bless the earth through my wife and I when we don't have any children? And up to this time, Sarah was barren. Sarah tried to help God, didn't she? You ever tried to help God? How did it turn out? Probably about the same way as it turned out with Abraham and Sarah. And oh, the nations of the earth are still dealing with what happened when Sarah tried to help God. And then instead of Abraham stepping up to the plate and saying, look, God has promised me this and, and He's going to fulfill it. I don't think He needs your help. Abraham said, okay. Do you think that Joseph had any problems? I mean, after all, he was the one with the coat of many colors, right? He was the one who was honored by his dad. I mean, he's the one who had the dreams of preeminence. I mean, remember his dream? I dreamed last night that I was, uh, I was this great sheath of grain, and you brothers of mine, and daddy too, you all bowed before mine. I had this dream of the universe and all the stars and the planets were subservient to me. Do you think Joseph had any problems? Do you think he had any struggles when his brothers decided to kill him? Cast him down into a pit? Sold him to the Ishmaelites going to, to a foreign land? He found himself in Egypt as a slave in Potiphar's house? accused of something he didn't do, cast into prison for more than two years, wondering the whole time, what is life about? I'm trying to serve God. I'm praying. I'm an, I'm an honorable man. I've done what is right. God, where are you in my life? And yet he remained faithful through the storms of life, through the rain, through the floods, through the, the changes, through the wind. He was tempted and tested. The cares of this life, he knew what it was about. The pleasures of life, he enjoyed. The cares of life, he was all around him. Do you think he had problems? Certainly he did. But how did God work through him in the end to put him to, to the saving of the entire world through the seven years of famine? after the seven years of plenty? Do you think that the Israelites had any problems? After the, the, after the ten plagues and God set them free to go to the land flowing with milk and honey, they just walked right in there, right? Oh, wasn't there a thing called the Red Sea that they had to face? Yes, and walk through it. How were they able to, able to do that? God took them right to the land of promise. Did they have any struggles? Did they make some wrong decisions? You know they did. Did Moses ever have any problems? I mean, he was brought up the first 40 years as Pharaoh's grandson. Trained in every way to become the next Pharaoh. And yet he knew within himself that something wasn't right and the struggle that he had within himself. We know he went for the next 40 years in the middle of nowhere in Midian. And then call, God called him to go and deliver the children of Israel. And for 40 years, he went every step they went. And he watched every one of his Israelite brothers die in the wilderness. And even when he was on the other side of the Jordan River about to go over, God said, you can't do it. Messy, dirty, broken. Do you think the disciples of Jesus ever had any problems? Do you think Peter made any mistakes? Do you remember when he warmed himself by the fire? Only a few hours before he had said, 
Though every disciple of yours would, would forsake you, Jesus, I will never forsake you. Remember Jesus saying to him, while before the rooster crows, you will deny that you even know me three times. I'm telling you, Peter said, I will not do this, this great and horrible thing. And yet, only a few hours later, Peter said, I'll tell you, I do not know him. And with language unbecoming of a Christian, after that third temptation, he said, I'll tell you, I don't know him. And then he heard the rooster crow. Oh, how he went out and wept bitterly. You think he ever had any struggles? You ever think he ever, things ever broke for him? What about the Apostle Paul? How many whippings? How many stonings? How many shipwrecks? Beaten with rods. How many times he's been rejected? Jesus, you ever th think he had any problems? The lost sheep, look at that. The prodigal son, you and me, don't we have struggles? Doesn't life kind of seem overwhelming sometimes? It's tough. We're trying to build a holy home. We're trying to build it on the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're trying to establish that and frame that up, all connected by love and in prayer. We're trying to cover that as for a protection. And we're going out into the world and we're facing the storms of life. What can we do when things tear up? What can we do when things get messy? I want to look at blind Bartimaeus and have him teach us today what he did when things were not right in his life. Because there's something, sometimes in my life, I'm not where I want to be. I'm not where I need to be. I know that things are not exactly the way they need to be with Cindy and me. Things are not right between my children and me. Things may not be right with my grandchildren and me. Things may not be right with my parents and me. Things may not be right with my fellow preachers where I, where I serve. The things may not right, be right in the con congregation, either with the elders or the deacons or with my, my associate minister. You know, I feel it. Something is wrong. We're struggling. What can we do? I want to offer five things, five ideas today that will help you, that will help me to get through these struggles, that will get through the storm, that will see Jesus even in the midst of the storm. First, I must take responsibility for myself for my relationships, for my home, for the congregation where I worship and work, for the city in which I live. I, as a citizen of the country that I belong to, Bartimaeus sat by the road begging alms. He heard that there was a Savior in town that could help him. He could have done any number of things. He could have made excuses as to why, even though Jesus was there, which is the answer to the struggle, the answer to his blindness, the answer to the storm, he could have said, you know, I'm blind. And because I can't see how am I going to get to Jesus? I'm a no, I know He's right there, but if I could see, I could get to Him. And of course, if I could see, I wouldn't need Him. He could have said, there are too many people in the way. You know, if there wasn't so many people in the street, I could get to Jesus. But because of all of these people, I'm not going to be able to do it. He could have said, well, you know, look at me, I'm blind. Nobody really has ever cared for me. And why would Jesus, this man that I don't even know, who claims to be the Son of God, at least that's what I've heard, why would He ever speak to me anyway? You see, He could have talked to Himself that way, and He could have made excuses as to why He couldn't get to Jesus, even though Jesus was so close. Where do we fit in that? When you know something's wrong, when you know that 
things are, me are messy, when you know that things at home are not that as they should be, do we make excuses as to why maybe we can't do anything about it? Or will we step up to the plate and take responsibility for what we can do about it, or maybe for what we have done to cause it? Blind Martimaeus could have blamed someone else. You know, we're really good at that. Maybe I am. I don't know about you. He could have said, you know, I'm blind and it's not my fault. After all, God is the one who did this for me. And if God would have wanted me to see, then He would have given me my sight. If Jesus was who people say He is, He would already know I'm standing over here. He would already know what I need. He would just give it to me. So I'll just sit right here and drown myself in my tears. You know, I would try, but look at all of these people. It's their fault. I would get to Jesus, but it's my parents' fault. It's God's fault. It's the elders' fault. It's the preacher's fault. It's my mama's fault. It's my dad's fault. It's my children's fault. It's the government's fault. He could have blamed any number of things or people or circumstances. How about us? Are we willing to step up and take responsibility for our home, for ourselves, for who we are. He could have allowed fear to keep him from coming to Jesus. What if I can't get there in time? What if I get there, but Jesus won't help me? What if I get there, but Jesus can't help me, even if he wanted to? We, could, we can let our fears keep us. What will people say about me? What will others think about me? He could have allowed his past to determine his future. If God would have wanted me to see, he would have given me my sight. If I'm healed, I'll probably have to work anyway. Think about that. I've thought about that in reading this uh, text. You know, Bartimaeus, once Jesus healed him of his sight, he had to get a job. Now, wait a minute. If I can see, I won't be able to beg anymore. I will actually have to go to work. You see, all of these excuses and blames and rationalizations, it's what we're all really good at. When things are wrong, when things are dirty, when things are messy, what can we do about it? Well, the first step is to take responsibility for the laundry. I mean, the laundry is going to pile up until someone grabs a big armload of it. And you know what you have to do with the laundry? You have to grab an armload of it and stuff it down in the washing machine. You have to push the right buttons. And you have to wait until it washes. And then you have to take it out of the washer and put it in the dryer. And then what? You take it out of the dryer and throw it in the corner, right? Or on the bed? What do you do? Someone has to fold those clothes and place them where they need to be or hang those clothes where they need to be. Who's going to do that when things get messy? Do you know how important a chore is at your home to get the trash taken out to the dumpster or to the garbage can outside or out by the roadside? Imagine, if you will, that the trash never gets taken out. Well, I mean, it's not my job. And you're saying, Cindy will say, well, it's not my job. And our daughter would say, well, it's not my job. And our son would say, it's not my job. Well, whose job is it? And so it's no one's job. It's no one's responsibility. So we just let the trash pile up and pile up and pile up. Things can get messy, can't they? When someone in the home doesn't step up and say, you know what? We need to get organized here. If we're going to be the home that God wants us to be, if we're going to build this home to be holy like God is, we're going to have to assign responsibilities and get organized. Who's going to do that? Well, hasn't God placed in the home someone as the head of that household? All right, dads, men... 
Are we fulfilling our responsibilities as the head of our household to get things organized? Or are we like so many others, maybe like we have been? We place that responsibility of leadership on our wives. Or maybe as parents, we place that responsibility on our children. Who's going to step up? I would ask for a show of hands. And I hope that every hand would go up. You know what? I'm willing to step up and take responsibility when things get messy to do what I need to do in my house. Oh, there were so many, my children are grown now, but there were so many Saturday mornings that we would sleep in a little bit. Cindy and I would get up. Our daughter Bridget and our son Ben would get up. And Cindy would assign each of us responsibilities. Notice I said Cindy would assign each of us responsibilities. But I oversaw oversaw her overseeing. You understand? I remember one time our son was playing his video game. And I went in and I said, Son, your mama's working. Your daddy's working. Your sister's working. What are you doing? Playing games. I said, well, what do you, do you like this picture? Don't you have responsibilities? Yes, sir. I said, well, let's get to it. He said, well, why do I have to do anything? I said, I'll tell you what. Why don't you just go and sit on the couch, let me bring you something to drink. You can play your video game. But when we as a family get ready to go on vacation go out to eat, go to the park, do some things that a family wants to do. Either you have to decide that you're going to be a part of this family or not. He said, but dad, I'm your son. I said, exactly. And as a member of this household, we each have a responsibility to God and to each other. Are you willing to step up, son, to take this responsibility? And here at the congregation at Phillip Street, you each have a responsibility to serve the Lord in every way you can, using your time, your talents, your treasures, to glorify God and to build up the kingdom. Are we doing that? Bartimaeus is teaching us, take responsibility. You have it. Don't don't just sit there. Do something about what's happened. The storms have come. The rain has descended. The floods have risen. The winds have blown. Temptation has come. What do we do? Bartimaeus took responsibility. And so he cried out to Jesus, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Second, not only must we take responsibility... We must put our faith in ourselves, in each other, but more importantly, in God. We must believe that our homes can be holy. We must believe to be able to see Jesus in the midst of the storm. See His power. See His glory. See His strength. And then tap into that power. Tap into that strength. Tap into that glory for ourselves. For He is our brother, our Savior. He is the one and only Son of God, and so are we children of God. We must believe that things can be better in our home. God is the great healer. He's the great help. He'll give us peace when there doesn't seem like there is any peace. He will give us vision when we can't hardly see. He will give us the wisdom and patience to get through the storm. You see, Bartimaeus believed in Jesus. He simply would not take no for an answer. When he cried out, Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus, help me. My life is a mess. Things are not right. I'm blind. I want things to be better. 
He cried out to the answer to the trouble. And though the people around him said, be quiet, be quiet, blind man, be quiet, he cried out the more. He wouldn't take no for an answer. Jesus said to him, what do you want? He said, I want to see. Do you know what you want? Do you know what you need? We need to figure that out. Do you know what's lacking at home? You feel it. You may see it. Maybe it's you. But we each have an individual responsibility. Do you believe that things can be different? I have found if I believe I can, I can. I have also found if I believe I can't, I can't. Jesus said to, to this blind man, let it be done to you according to your faith. What if Jesus were to say that to us? God, we're praying today. We want to build a holy home for you. I want my body and myself to be an honor and a glory to you because I live in this house. I want my home, the Burleson household, to be an honor and glory to you. I want the world to see our home and see you in us. I want that. And I believe that you can give me what I need, provide me for my needs so that I can have that. The storms may blow. The rain may come down. The wind may blow. The, the flood may rise. Temptation may be all around me. But I remember Psalm 23 where David writes, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. David was able to see that. So can we, if we would believe in God, trust and obey God to the point where we're going to trust Him and not what we can see. As Christians, do we walk by sight or by faith? And that's a question that only you can answer. We know what God calls us to. He calls us to walk by faith. We can't always see where we're going to end up. Sometimes we can. Most of the time we can't. But we trust God as blind Bartimaeus did. Number three, we must stop waiting to take responsibility to believe in God. We got to stop waiting for the circumstances to be ideal. Every one of us from time to say, we say time for time, we say, you know, as soon as I feel better, I'm going to take responsibility. If I, when I feel better about it, when the, when the circumstances are just right, I will act. Well, as soon as my family gets organized, then I'm going to take, take my responsibility. I'm going to wait for Cindy to do what she's supposed to do, and then I will. When will I ever do that? I'm going to make, wait for everything to be just right. Bartimaeus could have said, you know, there's too many people. If God would have wanted me this way, He would have made me this way. I mean, there's a thousand things, thousand rationalizations we could do to make sure that the, the circumstances are just right for us to walk down one of these aisles and make the change that we've been knowing we needed to make for years. Before moving to uh, Louisville, Kentucky, I was in Arkansas, Conway, Arkansas, where my daughter and her family, my son and his family live. One Sunday I was preaching, and about five minutes before the conclusion of the sermon, one of our men, who had, hadn't missed a Sunday in years, got up out of his pew, walked down the pew, and out the back door. I didn't think anything about it. I thought maybe he was going to the restroom or get some water. About two or three minutes later, he came to the back door and stood. When I offered the invitation, he came down the aisle, sat on the front pew. 
And when we finished singing, I went to him and I said, what are you doing down here? He said, Brother Mickey, I've been sitting back in that pew for 17 years. And every Sunday when the preacher finished preaching, I knew in my heart that I needed to respond to the invitation, confess my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized for the remission of my sins. But I kept putting it off. I'll do it in the spring. I'll do it in the summer. I'll do it in the fall. I'll do it in the winter. I'll do it when my mom's here. I'll do it when my dad's here. I'll do it when my children get a little older. I'll do it when my wife gets a new job. I mean, how many, how many circumstances can we put in front of ourselves so that it would be ideal for me to take advantage of the opportunity that I have to make a change I need to make today. And so he said to me today, when I walked out the back door, I was leaving. Once again, denying the responsibility that's mine to come to Christ. He said, I put my hand on the back door and I spoke within myself, enough, enough. I'm not going to fight anymore. He said, I, when I, I took my hand off the back door and I came back in and I responded to the invitation. I finally took the responsibility that's mine and I stopped waiting for the circumstances to be exactly the way I thought they needed to be. If the weather is right or the time of day is right or if I have the right feeling or when life gets worse or better or when the right people are here or not here or when I get around to it. How many of you remember those round to it's? You know, everybody said, when I get around to it, I'm going to do that. And Christians started keeping wooden round to it's in their pocket. And so when we heard that phrase, when, you, when I get around to it, Brother Mickey, I'll do that. And I would reach in my pocket and hand him a round to it. Now it's time. Stop waiting for ideal circumstances. If things are not right at home, take responsibility. Take what's yours. Believe that you can change. Believe that the home can be holy. Believe that we can last through the storms of life. Believe that we can see Jesus even in the midst of the storm. Fourthly, we got to stop worrying about what people will think say and do. You know, I would make a change. But what will people think about me if I come forward? I mean, people will think that something's wrong. Duh! Haven't you heard through this whole series of lessons in our lectureships this year? Life is not always a bed of roses. It's not always wine and roses walking down the aisle. You know, when a, when a bride and groom get married on the wedding day, isn't it all wine and roses? They've got a pocket full of money. She looks better than she's ever looked in her life. He looks better than he ever looked in his life. They have reservations somewhere for a honeymoon. His side of the family is happy. Her side of the family are happy. Everybody's happy. The preacher's happy. God's happy. It's a beautiful thing, marriage. And then you get in from the honeymoon. And there's this awful sound coming from the other side of the bed. It's like a rumble of thunder. What have I done? Things get messy. we got to stop worrying about what people think or say or do. Bartimaeus didn't worry about people. He had probably heard just about everything anyway. Sitting on that street, begging for alms. You know, they say that blind people can hear very well. I figure they can. 
His only concern was not what the people thought about him, not what the people would say about him, or not what the people would do about him. His only thought is, I've got to get to Jesus. I've got to find the answer to the question. I have to find the solution to the problem. I have to get to Jesus. And so he cried out the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Is this the reason you've been waiting to make the corrections you need to make within yourself or within your home? Is that you've been too worried about what someone's going to say about it? Or what someone's going to do about it? Or what someone's going to think about it? Out in the lobby one time, I shook one of our ladies' hands, and she said, I hear you've been visiting all the, some of the members in the congregation. Uh, I would like you to come over to my house. I said, is that an invitation? She said, well, I, I'm going to have some, to get some time, uh, have a little time to clean my house. I said, well, sister, I'm not coming to see your house. I'm coming to see you. What your house looks like doesn't matter to me. What you look like is, is what matters to me. Who you are. Someone said, if you're coming to see my house, give me two weeks. If you're coming to see me, just come on. And that's about the way it is. You and I, we need to stop worrying about what people will think, what people will say, what we people will do. The Burleson household is our household. The Brewer household is their household. I can't do for him, for Andy, and Andy can't do for me. I have my own individual responsibility. Andy has his own resp individual responsibility. And we can go around the room from right to left all the way back. If things are not right, if you're not where you need to be, if you're not where you want to be, welcome to the club. We've either been there, we are there, or we will be there. If you've been there, you know. You've been like blind Bartimaeus. You've taken responsibility. You've believed that you could be a different man, a different woman, a different boy, a different girl. You've stopped waiting for ideal circumstances. You have not worried anymore about what people think or say or do. You know what? You, you said, you know what? I'm going to do what I need to do and I'm going to do it right now. There's no better time than now. Don't doubt. Don't wait. Do what needs to be done. You can do that. God Himself has given you the power, the privilege, the strength, and the way. Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, If you want a holy home, if you want to come to the Father, He's got the way. He is the way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Come to Jesus. Do what you need to do now. Get what you need today. You can do that. If you have a need, you can come as we stand together, as we sing.